continue. Okay, so now I'll stop it. I'll stop it. For today, Dr. Lal, and a special hello to our guests, including Dr. Jane and Dr. Nina Patel, who have joined us today. Some of you might know that we have established the MK Gandhi Center, Inner Peace and Sarvodaya at Fresno State. We are grateful to Drs. Nina and Ravi Patel and their foundation for their generous donation that has made their dream of this center and its future work a reality. Dr. Veena Howard, who also serves as the endowed chair of Jain and Hindu Dharma, has recently been appointed the director of the center, and we are truly grateful for her transformative work. We are so excited to initiate the center's programming with today's lecture. Thank you all for being here. And again, welcome. Thank you so much, Dean Chapman. I know you are so busy. We appreciate you coming on. Uh, so we are really excited about Dr. Vinilal's talk, focusing on Gandhi's court trial and his statement on March 18, 1922. Uh, so we selected this date deliberately. Today is March 18 in India. So it is the 100th anniversary of the trial. So um, our department chair, as Dean Champ Chapman mentioned, um, fell ill, but he sends his uh, good wishes for all of us and we send him our good wishes. So I would like to acknowledge the support of, um, of course, the MK Gandhi Center, JP and Renu Sethi Foundation, uh, Peace and Conflict Studies Program at Fresno State, um, also the Ethics Center and Fresno State's Alumni Association. Um, so about the format, uh, Dr. Lal will speak for 35 minutes or so, and we'll have, have some time for Q&A. Some of my students have read Gandhi's statement and they're excited about this presentation. So I request all of you to keep your mics uh, microphones muted. Uh, please type your questions in chat and I'll invite you to turn your microphone and speak after the talk. And I think we'll give priority to our students' questions and I hope that's okay with everyone. So a little bit about uh, Dr. Vinilal. He's a distinguished professor. Uh, he's a professor of history at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. He is also a blogger, cultural critic, writer, and public commentator. Please check out his YouTube channel. He is the author or editor of 18 books. He is truly prolific. Please see his complete bio on the registration page. So uh, I welcome Dr. Lal and the floor is yours. Thank you, Veena. Um, I'm just trying to uh, just uh, like to thank the Department of Philosophy uh, at Cal State Fresno for uh, inviting me to give this talk. As Professor Howard has mentioned, the occasion for this talk is the 100th anniversary of the trial of Mohandas Gandhi, 100th anniversary almost to the hour, uh, I would say, because the trial started at uh, 12 noon. So it's just a few hours short of that. Um, before I venture into a discussion of the intricacies of this trial and the preceding events, what I'd like to do is I'd like to share a very short PowerPoint. Uh, I will not use that PowerPoint later on, so I thought I would sort of get it out of the way at the beginning. It will give you a kind of a bro brief overview uh, of the talk and a few images that I'd like to share, and then I'll move straight into uh, the talk. So let me see if I can first uh, share this PowerPoint. All right, so are all of you uh, able to see the PowerPoint? All right, excellent. Um, so this is uh, roughly the outline of the talk today. It's in six sections, not of equal length. Uh, the first is the incident of Chauri Chaura. So this is an incident that occurred in early 1922. Um, and it is a part of the backdrop, if I may put it this way, of the circumstances that led to Gandhi's arrest, um, his trial and his conviction. Then I'm gonna talk about the circumstances that led to his arrest and 
will give you an idea of the kind of protracted exchange of correspondence, which was of course not public. This is part of the archival record that led to the arrest of Gandhi. Then I want to move to a discussion of the political trial. What is a political trial? Um, I think all of you would agree with me that we are all familiar with this thing called the courtroom drama. In fact, I think one of the most popular genres of cinema is the courtroom drama. Think about films such as uh, Witness for the Prosecution, Judgment at Nuremberg, To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, courtroom dramas can be very gripping. And I think this is the least of the words that we can use to describe what happened at Gandhi's trial. And then I want to suggest that the courtroom is a kind of a performative space and will therefore also hint at what were some of the risks involved in putting Gandhi on trial. And then I finally move in the concluding two sections to the trial of Gandhi itself, including the very preliminary proceedings, which are really quite extraordinary because of the particular description that Gandhi offered of who he was. Um, and so I'll, I'll make some comments and observations about that. And then I'll move to a discussion of some of the passages from the trial. So that's going to be the nature of the proceedings for today. Uh, what you see here is a photograph. So all the photographs that follow were taken by me in 2013. Um, and this is a photograph of what is called the circuit house. So the circuit house uh, uh, is a, a phrase that is used to designate accommodations for government officials, particularly when they're on tour. Um, and this idea of a circuit house first arose in colonial India. So it was, not a, uh, it was not a traditional courtroom where Gandhi was tried. Rather, it was this building called the circuit house at Shahi Bagh uh, in Ahmedabad. Uh, and, and this here uh, is the room where Gandhi was tried. We now move to the interior of the room, which is now, of course, being memorialized. You can see a portrait of Gandhi here, smaller, smaller uh, framed photographs here. And this is a painting, which I will show you in just a moment, but it was a relatively small space where the proceedings were held. Um, and this is a painting by an artist. I think he's from Gujarat, but I have not been able to find any information about him. I, I did speak to the people at the circuit house. They were clueless about who the artist was. Um, his name is Moshin. Shake, you can see the signature over here, and it, this is an artistic rendering of what happened at the trial. Um, and this here is the first page uh, of the transcript of the judge's remarks. Uh, this goes back to 1922, which is on display. Um, and the last slide here, and then I'll stop the screen sharing, is a mural. Um, and for those of you who are seeing it attentively, you'll see the motorcycles there. So this is a street mural uh, of the trial, right? Which suggests that the trial lives on in popular memory in, in various ways. This is part of the folklore of the trial. All right, so now let me move on to um, the talk. So Mohandas Gandhi had, arrived in India in 1915. He left South Africa for the last time in the summer of 1914. Uh, and when he left, uh, there is a uh, observation I want to share uh, of uh, General Smuts. So General Smuts was his most well-known opponent um, in South Africa. And General Smuts writes a letter to a friend where he says, the saint, has finally left our shores. I sincerely hope forever. Right? So it's, it's beautiful sort of ironical comment and suggests the kind of ambiguities in many ways that Gandhi's opponent said because he is an opponent, but he says the saint, right? Uh, has finally left our shores. And yet he's happy that the saint has left, right? And I think that this sets the tone for what happens in the proceedings, if I may put it this way. So Gandhi arrives in India in 1915. It's a very long and complicated story how he became ascendant in Indian politics in the course of five years, because when he returned to India, he did not return to a country that was a vacuum of political leadership. There were giants such as Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Lala Lajpat Rai, 
Chitaranjan Das, Bipin Chandra Pal, and many others, very formidable people who in any other situation would have been recognized as extraordinary figures. But you know, when someone like Mohandas Gandhi comes along, and then over the long course of history, he just eclipsed everyone. So unless you're a historian of India, you've never really heard of many of these figures. Um, but the point is that Gandhi returns to an India where there is political ferment. Now he acquires the leadership in ways that I cannot discuss right now. It's well outside the purview of my talk by 1920. And in December of 1920, he promises his people Swaraj in one year. He says, if you follow the principles of Ahimsa and Satyagra, I can promise you Swaraj. Literally freedom, the word is far more complicated, but let's just take the minimal meaning right now, freedom, in one year. Now, one year passes, it's early 1922. India is in the thick of what is called the non-cooperation movement, which Gandhi had launched in 1920. And even though Gandhi did not actually hold any position of leadership within the Congress formally, he was only elected president of Congress once, and that was in 1925. But, but he was the undeclared dictator of the Congress already by this time. He's a generalismo of the Congress, right? which is to say that nothing really could be done without his approval. And so in fact, in 1921, the Congress passed a resolution saying that we virtually give dictatorial powers. That's not the word that is used, but that's effectively what it is. We give him the sole authority to carry out the mandate of the Congress, which of course ultimately is going to be the achievement of Indian independence. Now in early 1922, an incident takes place in a dusty market town. There are hundreds, thousands of such towns in India, uh, even today. And this town is called Chauri Chaura. It's in Uttar Pradesh. And what happens there is that, you know, these Congress volunteers, the, uh, there are also other political actors involved because there was a movement going on called the Khilafat movement. So there were some Khilafat organizers there as well. So they're undertaking a march. They had already been provoked because a number of Congress volunteers had been arrested in other parts of Uttar Pradesh close to Chauri Chaura. And they're, they're undertaking a procession. They're about to land up at a market, which is very close to Chauri Chaura um, because they want to enforce a hartal. The police issue a warning saying that this crowd is unauthorized. The crowd jeers the police tanedar, that is the, the sub-inspector, the person who's the, the station head officer. He issues a warning by, by firing uh, dummies into the blank shots. Um, and so goes the story that everyone says, these bullets are going to be turned into rain by the power of Mohandas Gandhi, by the power of Gandhiji. And then he actually fires real bullets and they pierce the flesh of a number of people. A couple of the volunteers are killed. The crowd gets incensed. It pursues these policemen into the police station. They close the doors, they set it on fire. Most of the policemen are killed in the fire. Some are able to emerge outside. When they emerge outside, they're hacked to pieces. 23 policemen die. And Gandhi unilaterally says, I am suspending the entire movement. Now this really made the other leaders of the Congress party, very uncomfortable. It would not be too much to say that probably some were almost incensed by this because the supposition was that the country had come a long ways. There is no question that certainly in some parts of North India, albeit just a few parts, the British administration had been paralyzed. And remember that Gandhi had pro promised Swaraj in one year. So the point, that they made was that, well, it's not up to Gandhi to decide whether the non-cooperation movement has, should be suspended. And if you read Jawaharlal Nehru's autobiography, he says that, that people like him were really puzzled because they said, well, what do events in one small market, dusty little town have to do with the future of Indian independence? And Gandhi's view was they have everything to do with it. 
because this outbreak of violence suggests that we are not ready yet for nonviolence. And it is very necessary at this juncture to make a distinction between Gandhi's embrace of nonviolence, because for Gandhi, nonviolence was not simply a tactic or even a strategy. It was a way of being in the world. It is the very soul of living. It is a creed, it is a principal commitment. And you cannot instrumentalize ahimsa. That was his view. So we have to make this distinction between nonviolence as a matter of tactics or even strategy and nonviolence as a way of being in the world, ahimsa as in fact a philosophy. Right? And this is what Gandhi was committed to. And it is irrelevant at this point whether that was realistic or not. I'm setting the backdrop for what is going to happen. Now, when the movement is suspended, obviously what's going to happen is that all over the country, non-cooperation movement is going to eventually sort of disappear in the days ahead. And the British had long been contemplating the arrest of Gandhi. So that brings me to the second part now, which I'll go through very quickly, because the arrest of Gandhi, as the archival record suggests, was a very complicated matter. They had been thinking of arresting him for at least the previous six months. And one of the reasons they had been thinking about arresting him is, of course, because they viewed Gandhi as a seditionist, okay, as a seditionist. That is someone who preached sedition. And sedition means obviously disaffection against the state. It means treason. And no state, I'm sure all of you would agree, no state will permit treason. Whatever the nature of the state, whether it's a democracy or a monarchy or an authoritarian state. So the view was that we need to do something about Gandhi, but then the question is why is there any ambivalence? Why not just put him in jail? Well, there are lots of reasons. For example, previous experience had showed the British that if you put the Mahatma in jail, he views that as a blessing. See, everything that you can use against him, he can turn against you. Because when he comes out of jail, he is invariably rejuvenated. He's a greater threat when he comes out of jail than he is before you put him into jail. And of course, I need not here get into the fact that that there is a long history over the course of 2000 years across various cultures, which looks at what we might call the philosophy of jail going, right? I mean, and in, of course in American history, think of, for example, the great essay that Henry David Thoreau wrote in a very comfortable jail, so to speak, or that he wrote as a consequence more accurately of his one day experience. He was in jail for only one day, and that is the experience that generated his famous essay on the duty of civil disobedience. Right? But we know, we know that Socrates was in jail, et cetera, et cetera. There are many such things that we can think of. So that was one reason. But then of course, there were much more practical reasons. One of the practical reasons why the British entertained doubts about it is because their view was that Gandhi outside jail exercises a restraining moderate influence. You see, because you've got others who are, who are not attuned to the philosophy of nonviolence and Gandhi exercises a restraining influence. So it's better to actually keep him outside jail. Thirdly, if you put him in jail, you're gonna make a martyr of him. And then of course, when Gandhi decided to suspend the non-cooperation movement, the view at that time was that, well, Gandhi fr frankly is finished. You should read what Lord Reading writes to his son after the trial where he says, well, you know, Gandhi's been convicted. He's been put in jail. It's been a month. There's been no outrage, no protest. We have seen the last of Gandhi, he says. We have seen the last of Gandhi. This old man is done for, right? Of course, Lord Reading, like every political opponent that Gandhi ever had in India is now a footnote, if that much in Indian history. Whereas Mohandas Gandhi, the folklore grows and grows. 
right? So you can see all the risks, all the, and I could give you page after page of citation from archival records that I looked through when I looked at this discussion that took place. And what, who was the discussion between? Between the government of Bombay, the government of British India, which are two different things, of course, related. And then, of course, the Secretary of State for India, who's sitting in London. So it's a three-way correspondence, and each of them have their own points of view, and each of them have certain arguments for whether Gandhi should or should not be arrested. But finally, after the trial, the decision is made that he is going to be arrested. And this brings me to the final point with respect to this set of issues, namely that he had to be arrested because the government view was that Gandhi's writings on sedition cannot be tolerated by the state. To give you an indication of what I mean by his writings, which are going to be the basis of the charges that are going to be laid against him. So he writes, for example, this is all in 1921 and early 1922, including a piece called A Puzzle and Its Solution published in Young India in, on December 15, 1921. He says the following, and I quote, we seek arrest because the so-called freedom is slavery. We are challenging the might of this government because we consider its activity to be wholly evil. We want to overthrow the government. He's calling for the overthrow of the government. It's very clear what the imperative of the state will have to be now. And now I continue the quote, we want to compel its submission to the people's will. We desire to show that the government exists to serve the people, not the people, the government. Lord Reading, that's the Viceroy, must clearly understand that the non-cooperators are at war with the government, right? Now, in this connection, it is also necessary to say and I can only demonstrate this if I were to give you 10, 15 quotes, which I, of course, I don't have the luxury to do right now, that you see a, a, the British, one of their last lines of defense is that they're a Christian power, a Christian power. The problem was that Gandhi was a much better Christian than anyone who pronounced himself or herself a Christian. So. He takes away that last line of defense. They can't say that we're going to, we're, we have to put Gandhi away because we're a Christian power and Christianity is on the right side of righteousness because Gandhi has taken away that last defense that they have, right? So this now brings me to the question of the trial. But first it is necessary to understand the political trial, the institution of the political trial. I would go so far as to argue that every major pivotal event in the history of colonial India is marked by a trial. So at the onset of British rule, the most majestic figures, majestic here in a neutral sense, that is to the, the most well-known figures are Warren Hastings, and Robert Clive. Robert Clive's conquest led to the establishment of the empire. Warren Hastings was the first governor general. Both of them were tried. Both of them were tried. Not in India, of course, back in England itself. Right? And then, of course, if we move into the 19th century, Bahadur Shah Zafar, the last Mughal emperor, in whose name the revolt, the rebellion of 1857 took place. Right? And what did the British do? They tried him on char charges of sedition. And of course they found him guilty. So perforce it is necessary to understand that the outcome of the trial is always known before the trial commences. It is known. This is the nature of the idea of the rule of law. And I'm gonna dwell on that in just a moment. So it's not the case that Bahadur Shah Zafar, the last great Mughal emperor who is tried on charges of sedition after the British have suppressed the rebellion of 1857-58, he's tried, convicted, and he's exiled to Burma. 
where he's going to past his, spend his last, you know, last 10, 15 years of his life. And then, of course, when we move into the late 19th century and we move into the 1900s, you look at Bal Gangadhar Telak, you look at Lala Rajpat Rai, you look at Bhagat Singh, you look at, of course, Gandhi, everyone is going to be tried. And in a manner of speaking, the last great moment, as it were, of British rule, in the sense in which I'm speaking, because now I'm speaking about rituals of sovereignty. The political trial is a ritual of sovereignty. The last great ritual of sovereignty was the INA trial, the Indian National Army trial, which the British conducted after the end of World War II, held at the Red Fort. Right? So I'm making a much larger argument about the nature of political trials that we have to understand that these are rituals of sovereignty and spectacles of the state. They are like imperial assemblages. All right? And that's the context in which we have to understand the trial of Mohandas Gandhi itself. Now, there are many other extraordinary issues related to the question of a political trial. What kind of socio sociology of knowledge is um, implicated in the trial? And what is the nature of the rule of law? So to conclude this section, let me just elaborate very briefly with the following set of observations. One argument that is frequently, indeed I would say invariably made against Gandhi and the advocates of nonviolence more generally is that this only works when your opponent is civilized. So the argument in short is that Gandhi could never have succeeded against Adolf Hitler or Stalin, or perhaps today, if we want to accept what we're hearing today, Vladimir Putin, right? That after all, Gandhi's opponents were the British, jolly good people overall, and colonialism in India was more or less a Sunday picnic. Once in a while, somebody was oppressed, of course, this overlooks, for example, the use of famine as a policy of creating genocide. I could give you a long, long account of the use of genocide by the English, not just in India, but in Ireland as well, right? And so forth and so on. But that is the view that the British were really a people who were addicted to the rule of law. What a lovely addiction to have. Wouldn't we all like to have such an addiction? Right? That is the argument. And Henry Sumner Main, who was part of the British cabinet in India, that's not what it was called. It was called the Governor General's Council. He is the law member and he says, India is a country that is empty of law, destitute of law. Because the view was that all that India had was oriental despotism before the British came there then they instituted the regime of the rule of law. And that is one reason why you couldn't just shoot Mohandas Gandhi dead, you had to bring him to trial. Which brings me to the fourth section, the courtroom, the performative space of the courtroom. One of the greatest hazards of bringing Indian nationalists, and in that sense, Gandhi was not singular, although his trial is singular. One of the hazards was they were all well versed in the law. You take, a, Bhagat Singh is something of an exception, but then if you take people like Jawaharlal Nehru himself was tried a number of times. If you take obviously Lala Lajpat Rai, you take Bal Gangadhar Tilak. Every one of these people is trained as a lawyer. They understand all the protocols of law. They know English law. They understand English common law. They understand what precedent means. And they know how to command the space of the courtroom. You have to command the space of the courtroom. It's an adversarial system. And this, they realized to their peril, was one of the hazards. So when you are bringing these people to trial, so when Bal Gangadhar Tilak was brought to trial 
first time in the 1890s and then second time in 1908. You read the proceedings of that trial, it's remarkable because Tillich is going to put the prosecution into a daze. His mastery of Marathi, Sanskrit, English, and the law meant that he could actually create a web of meanings and the prosecutors were no match for him. But of course he was still convicted. Remember, don't forget that, that they have to go through this ritual of sovereignty, ritual of the rule of law, which raises a very important question that I cannot address here. That's a subject for an entirely different talk, which is that, is the rule of law always just really rhetorical? And my answer is, no, it's not. There has to be some instances where it works as the rule of law for it to have credibility. But this is the set of problems that I'm really trying to explicate when I speak about the performative space of the courtroom, right? And now finally we come to the trial. So when Gandhi is brought to trial, the first thing that happens is the arraignment. You're arraigned, right? You're brought before the magistrate and Gandhi is asked to fill out a form where he gives his particulars, name, date of birth. And then there's a question on that form, profession. What does Mohandas Gandhi state? He says, and I quote, farmer and weaver. It is as though he is the author of Satyagra only incidentally. Secondarily, it's not even mentioned, the author of a unique philosophy of nonviolent resistance, the architect of the idea of deploying nonviolence as a strategy, none of this. He doesn't say I'm a political agitator, I'm a political activist, much less does he say as many people today say, oh, I'm a radical leader of this or that, no. He says, I'm a farmer and weaver. Now you might say that he was being disingenuous. I would say no, he was very much a farmer. Why? Every ashram, I use that word loosely to, to go back to the days in South Africa when he set up both the Phoenix settlement and then Tolstoy farm, but they were like ashrams. And then of course he comes to India, he moves, sets up, Sabarmati, there's another smaller ashram where, where he stays, that's irrelevant. I'm looking at the larger picture. And then of course, Varda later on, right? In every ashram, Gandhi, they grew vegetables, they grew farms. Gandhi himself was meticulously attentive to the question of what one should eat, what is good for oneself, what is good for the soil. He was very attentive to questions of diet, nutrition, farming. But of course, he farmed a good deal more than vegetables and fruits. He seeded many great ideas. And to farm means to husband. Let's go back to the old Greek meaning of the word economy, to husband the wealth of a people, of a nation. In every respect, Mohandas Gandhi was also a farmer. And then when we get to the idea of a weaver, all of you are familiar with the fact, if you have even the most rudimentary picture of Gandhi in mind, that he spun and he wove, right? But here again, we, and, and this was crucial. This was crucial for lots of reasons that I cannot, of course, at this point enter into because we'd have to look at his economic philosophy, his economic views, and we'd have to understand the importance of weaving as a part of his daily regimen, right? He doesn't meditate. This is his meditation. This is his yoga. He doesn't do asans, but it's the philosophy of the hand, the hand. We don't have a book yet or even really a good article on the hand and what that meant to Gandhi, right? But he is also, now let's extend the meaning metaphorically, right? That he does weave a yarn. He weaves and spins and sets up all kinds of networks which were really extraordinary, really extraordinary. The number of institutions that become part of his network, the spider's network, so to speak, right? 
So farmer and weaver, extraordinary. And of course, then he is asked, how does he plead? And he says, guilty. But this is all before the trial. One week later, and that brings me next now to the final part. One week later, he is wheeled into the courtroom. The person who is going to try him, his prosecutor is Sir Thomas Strangman, Advocate General of Bombay Presidency. So a very senior, very senior official. The court is presided over by a man called Judge Broomfield. And if you look at the engagement, the unpublished engagement diary of Judge Broomfield, it is remarkable because for that day, you see the entry for March 18th. What were his engagements for that day? That what he writes down scarcely hints at the world historical event that would unfold before him in literally the next few hours. Because what did he write? And I quote, golf before breakfast, line two, try Gandhi, period. That's, that's his engagement diary for March 18th, 1922. The trial begins at 12 o'clock. And Sarojini Naidu was among those who were present at the trial. Sarojini Naidu is a major Indian nationalist and she has offered a gripping account. She says that when Gandhi is brought into the courtroom, the whole court stands. Um, in the Gandhi film by Attenborough, you see the judge standing too. That is incorrect, of course, because the judge is always the last person to enter. Um, the prisoner is brought in first, usually. But I don't want to be entirely certain about that, but that's how it's shown. In any case, there is a kind of air of reverence in the courtroom. That's what the accounts suggest. Now the proceedings are marked entirely by what one would describe as courtesy, civility, decorum. Indeed, I would go so far as to say chivalry, right? Um, we don't hear that word anymore. It's one of many words in the English language that is now almost archaic if I may put it this way. Um, virtue, whoever talks about virtue, except unless you're discussing Greek philosophy and Socrates and you know those kinds of things. I mean, do you ever hear the word, you hear vice, but when do you ever hear of anyone having any virtue, right? Uh, and again, that's a subject for another talk, words such as shame. I mean, no one ever feels any shame anymore, which is why you can have billions of influencers telling you what they're doing every single moment, wholly uninteresting, but nonetheless, they think it is, monumental, there's no concept anymore of these ideas. And that's a very interesting point in itself. One of the key things about Gandhi's statement is his insistent, persistent, both insistent and persistent use of the word duty. And again, I just simply alert you to this because that too is a very long subject. Because think of it only in this way, think of the supreme irony of the fact that the person who is viewed as one of the great architects of the rights movement, we're living right in an age of rights. Everyone wants rights for everything. And one of the things that's happened in the course of the last 70 years since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was passed is what are considered rights, that itself has grown enormously. So now it's not just a right to, to our liberty and to our person. It's the right to clean air, to good food, to organic food. I mean, that's a right according to many people, right? Right to this and that. Gandhi is of course the architect, not by design at all, of one of the movements of rights. The right to freedom, the right to resist a colonial oppressor but Gandhi never spoke in the language of rights. He only spoke in the language of duties. And that, as I said, is what is enormously interesting in the first instance about this trial. Okay. 
So when the trial commences, the judge says, how do you plead? Gandhi says guilty. Let me little add a little footnote, just for the sake of the record, not really critically important, but just so that somebody doesn't say, well, what happened to the second person? There is a second person alongside Gandhi, and that's the publisher of the journal, Young India, Shankar Lal Banker. So he also has tried alongside Gandhi. So the two of them are tried, but Gandhi is the one who delivers a speech and then the indictment and everything. And then the charges are offered. So what were the exact charges on which Gandhi and Banker were tried? The charges were, I quote, of bringing or attempting to bring into hatred or contempt or exciting or attempting to excite disaffection towards his majesty's government by law in British India. Okay. In short, Gandhi is accused of what is called creating hatred towards the government or attempting to create hatred towards the government established by law. Let's not forget that second part. That goes back to what I was referring to earlier. The British are saying, we are legitimate. We are a legitimate government because we, this is a government established by law. Of course, with, when, when we say by law, then we say, well, with whose consent, right? So, and this is where there would be a problem because then the British would have to say, ah, well, we don't have the explicit consent, but there is no question that Indians have experienced for the first time ever the rule of law and they appreciate it, right? And this, these charges are proffered, put forward under section 124A of the penal code, which as a little footnote, I might add the Indian government is still using, all right? So this is one of the most common problems in India today is the use of the charge of sedition against political dissenters. But we leave that aside. So that's the charge. There are three charges because there are three articles. I quoted to you from one article from Young India. There are three articles. Initially, there were four. They dropped it to three. And each of these charges applies to each of the articles. Right? That is the le legal matter that is at stake over here, the legal matter. So. Gandhi says, I plead guilty to these charges. And then the judge says, well, I'm inclined to pronounce sentence because the question is why have a trial at all? So to speak, because the man has pleaded guilty. Okay. And then the advocate general says, well, I'd like to be actually have a trial because the advocate general wants, argues that I want to show how serious this offense is of sedition. And even though Mr. Gandhi has pleaded guilty, this does not convey to the public, it would be in the public interest to know why the British thinks that he committed sedition. Now he was perfectly within his rights to argue that, the advocate general, just as the judge was perfectly within his rights to say a trial is not necessary because the accused have pleaded guilty, both Gandhi and Banker. And now all that it remains for me to do is to actually pass sentence. So then he says to Mr. Gandhi, do you have anything to say before I pass sentence? And Gandhi says, I do. And now we have two sets of remarks here that Gandhi is going to offer. One is extempore. That is he brought a written statement with him, which he's going to read out later, but first he just simply says a few things off the top of his head. And he says, I want to say, first of all, that the proceedings have been marked by absolute civility. And I'm delighted to say that this is how a courtroom should be run. And I congratulate you, he says to the judge and to the advocate general for extending the civility to me. Then he says, I want you to think about this one. He says, the advocate general has been completely fair to me. In fact, he has been far too kind to me because the advocate general in his remarks, so Strangman you know, gives a few remarks, 
before the judge turns to Gandhi. And the advocate general had said that Gandhi had made these remarks and these remarks amounted to sedition. And he's been doing this for so, many, so much period of time. And Gandhi says to the advocate general and to the court, I've actually been preaching disaffection for longer than you claim that I have been, right? So I just want to correct the record. And he says, this is a passion for me to preach disaffection against the government. There is a fire burning within me. I recognize that I'm a highly educated man and I was playing with fire when I led the country on the path of nonviolence and I accept the responsibility. I accept the responsibility. And this is in one regards to which I have to say that this trial is different from the trial of Socrates. If you look at this little book, there are many editions of it, of this book, which is The Last Days of Socrates, which has, of course, the Apology and Crito and one other dialogue. And in the Apology, remember what Socrates says, and I quote, the proper course for me, gentlemen of the jury, is to deal first with the earliest charges that have been falsely brought against me. Gandhi is not refuting the charges. He's saying not only are these charges true, they actually are too kind to him because my offense is greater than what these charges appear to indicate. Right? You see, this is what I mean when I say constantly that Gandhi has a way of disarming the opponent. They just don't know what to do with it. Right? So this is what Gandhi says in his extempore remarks, which he then concludes by saying, I invite you, the judge, to listen to what I'm saying. And then if you think that the proceedings over which you are presiding and this trial is actually fair in the sense that British rule is fair, then if you think I am guilty, then your obligation is to sentence me to the highest possible prison term that this particular charge will permit. And if you don't think that's the case, then you're free to tender your resignation. And then he adds, of course, with his sly kind of, I might say almost afterthought, I don't expect this conversion on your part, right? I don't expect you to be converted, but nonetheless, here's the choice. You're not choice, right? I mean, the free liberal, you know, market economy all rides on choice. So you see, it's a choice that he's giving the judge. Then he reads out the written statement. And what I want to do by way of concluding is look very briefly at four of his remarks. And then we'll just conclude by telling you what observers said about the end of the trial, right? So in order to understand the tenor of his remarks, it's not an extraordinarily long uh, uh, speech, but nonetheless, a uh, uh, written statement, but, and, and, and speech is the right word because he delivers it uh, as a speech. And, um, and remember that here now I'm referring to the written statement now, no longer to the extempore remarks that he delivered, all right? And so um, in his statement, the first thing I want to point your attention to, so the, what is the general tenor? The general tenor of his statement is that, look, he describes how he began his life as a cooperationist. That is that he cooperated. He thought that the British Empire that the Indians could acquire rights within the empire. Right? Gandhi was not a proponent of complete independence for many years. What he was aiming to do was to give India the same status, if I may put it very loosely, the same status that the white colonies that had acquired dominion status had, such as Australia and New Zealand. Right? So he's very clear about that. That that's how he began his life. And in fact, he actually helped to recruit soldiers for British wars. There's no question about that. But he then describes his journey, how he becomes a non-cooperationist, how he begins to see that British rule in India is an unmitigated disaster and evil. That is what this statement is. It is also in very pithy words, 
a devastating indictment of colonial rule. So in that sense, it is a, one of the founding documents of anti-colonialism, globally speaking. I want to register this fact with all the emphasis at my command. So he says that, so after having sketched over the course of one page, the political history of the last several decades, especially, he says, and this is the first passage, I came reluctantly to the conclusion that the British connection had made India more helpless than she ever was before, politically and economically. A disarmed India has no power of resistance against any aggressor if she wanted to engage in an armed conflict with him. Now this comment puzzles many students of Gandhi because they say, why is he complaining about the fact that India is disarmed if he is an advocate of nonviolence? Now the British had passed the Arms Act in the aftermath of the rebellion of 1857-58, which they had suppressed. And the conclusion of which was that India was no longer under company rule. It was now officially under the crown and the administration of India changed. We won't get into technicalities about whether India really was under company rule for the preceding you know, 50 years because it was and it wasn't. And parliament was exercising a lot of control, but technically and officially that was the case. The Arms Act is passed. In brief, what Gandhi is doing is he's distinguishing between the nonviolence of the weak and the nonviolence of the strong. He's saying, that if you are nonviolent because you do not have any other alternative, that is no nonviolence. That is the nonviolence of the weak. The real nonviolence is of those who have the recourse to arms, who can use it, and who forsake the arms, who realize that there is a mightier weapon than the gun. Right? So when India is disarmed, it doesn't make India nonviolent, not at all. And of course, this also has a relationship to those who embrace nonviolence as a matter of tactic and strategy, something about which I spoke about before, rather than those who were committed to the idea of nonviolence as a creed. Secondly, and this is the point at which I want to emphasize that this statement is in fact a absolute masterpiece of English writing. A masterful demonstration of Gandhi's command over the English language, its idioms, the rhetoric of the language. And I can tell you, by the way, that there are people who, who deal with legal rhetoric and they actually use this speech even today. So listen to the sentence. He says, British officials in India are well-intentioned, many of them. They think that the system of administration they're presiding over is one of the best in the world. And this is what he says, and I quote, little do they realize that the government established by law, now you understand the significance of that, right? Established by law in British India is carried on for this exploitation of the masses. No sophistry. Ah, Socrates once again, because remember Socrates had a battle, so to speak, with the sophists, right? No sophistry, no jugglery in figures can explain away the evidence that the skeletons in many villages present to the naked eye. Now you see, it's the juxtaposition of sophistry and evidence because the sophists have no evidence. Look at the construction of the sentence. The juxtaposition, the first sentence of law and exploitation because law's intent is to eliminate exploitation, diminish it, to address it, to secure justice. And he says, little do they realize that the government established by law in British India is carried on for this exploitation. That's the juxtaposition. Law, exploitation, 
sophistry, evidence, jugglery, right? You see the juggler and then the naked eye because you get deceived as it were. That is the command, right? And, but of course, it's a severe indictment of colonial rule, right? And in the interest of time, I'll skip the third, get to the fourth illustration so I can move in a minute to my conclusion. And then he says, in a st statement, which is characterized by its directness, its simplicity, it's almost biblical. What does he say? Affection cannot be manufactured or regulated by law, period. Affection cannot be manufactured. You see, the law can tell you that you cannot discriminate against a person. And the law can penalize you for discriminating. The law can penalize you now for hate speech, but the law cannot make you love another person. The law cannot make you even like another person. And this is one of the problems that when we're thinking about social change, can we effect it only through law? Gandhi is very clear, absolutely not. Absolutely not. In fact, the law might be a form of sophistry. It may delude you into thinking that you have actually become better, that society has become better. Right? So that is really the course of his remarks. And then he concludes it once again by saying to the judge that this is where I stand. I invite you now to give me the highest sentence or to resign your position. And what do the spectators, because they had their part to play too. You see, these are all set pieces, so to speak. So we are told that what happened in the court as the trial ended, okay? And I will just read out the, a paragraph because I have an article on this appearing tomorrow in Open Magazine in India on the trial. So this is my first public, this lecture is my first public foray into this. And this is what he, this is what I want to conclude with. Gandhi had said that he did not expect conversion on the part of the judge, but Broomfield was clearly moved and more. The law is no respecter of persons, he stated, but he could not ignore the fact that Gandhi was, quote, in a different category from any person that he had ever tried or was likely to try. So he says that, look, I can't ignore the fact that in the eyes of millions, you are viewed as a patriot, as a great leader. And in fact, there are even people who think that you're a man of high ideals and of noble and of even saintly life. Once again, the saint, right? That's my framing here too. The bookends, so to speak. In a, a saint in a political trial. Okay. Nevertheless, says Broomfield, I'm a judge and I have but one duty to perform. And that is to judge you as a man subject to the law who by his own admission has violated the law. Gandhi himself has said I violated the law. So Ga Broomfield proceeds to sentence Gandhi to six years of simple imprisonment and then says that no one would be more pleased than I would be if in the course of events in India, it becomes possible to reduce the sentence. That I would be the most delighted person if it became possible to release you earlier. The proceedings had been marked by extraordinary civility, as I've said, even sh chivalry, and that judge was applauded. Even as in the words of Sarojini Naidu, the emotion of the people burst in a storm of sorrow as a long, slow procession moved towards him, the Mahatma, in a mournful pilgrimage of farewell, end quote. The crowd builds around Gandhi, some sobbed and fell at his feet. And Naidu says that she felt herself being transported to the distant past when, quote, the lowly Jesus of Nazareth furnished the only true parallel in history to this invincible apostle of Indian liberty who loved humanity with surpassing compassion, end quote. The reporter for the Bombay Chronicle, which is an English 
owned newspaper that was friendly to the Indian nationalists. It was run by a man called Horniman. And if you go to Bombay, there is a place called Horniman Circle named after him, right? The reporter for this newspaper felt that the trial of the greatest man of the world, that was the headlines, brought to mind, quote, a moving scene recalling the sentence of Socrates, cool and smiling to the last moment amidst his pupils, end quote. So if you read Socrates, you know that when Socrates is last moments, you know, the disciples, they're all weeping. And Socrates is smiling, laughing. This is how you should spend your life and how you should end it, as Kabir had said in a very famous dua a long time ago. Spectators at the trial could have been forgiven for thinking that it was not Mohandas Gandhi, but the state that was on trial. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lal. This was very stimulating. We have a lot of questions, some uh, privately, some in, um, in publicly. So we have